I'm Mark Duggan, the director of CIFR, which is the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. I'm thrilled that so many of you are able to join us online today for this month's virtual associates meeting. It looks like we have a really excellent turnout, and that certainly makes sense given today's speaker, Nick Bloom, and the topics that he's going to cover, the economic outlook in the months ahead, and the impacts of working from home. Uh, I really appreciate all of you for your support for what we do at CEPR, especially now during the trying circumstances that have been brought upon us by the COVID-19 pandemic. I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately, but everyone at CEPR has really been stepping up to fulfill our core missions of supporting economic policy relevant research, sharing it broadly, and bringing together key leaders in the policy, academic, business, and philanthropy worlds. You can get a better sense of all of our academic output and the expertise of our faculty by visiting our website and following CEPR on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And again, I'm really grateful that you're all with us here uh, for today's event featuring Nick Bloom. Nick is one of our senior fellows at CEPR and is the William D. Everly Professor of Economics at Stanford. Um, I don't think that Nick's phone has stopped ringing since this crisis began and people started working from home two months ago. He actually conducted a fascinating study a few years ago, and he'll be going into more details about this during his presentation that showed worker productivity actually went up when employees at a Chinese travel company were allowed to work from home. The study received a ton of attention when it came out, but it's taken on a new life in the past two months as journalists, business leaders, and many others have been turning to Nick as the go-to expert on how best to manage the pitfalls and the benefits of a workforce that's cranking away at home instead of in a traditional office setting. Nick has also made a name for himself before the pandemic as an expert on economic uncertainty. He's developed so-called uncertainty indices that help gauge market ups and downs, and he's applied several uncertainty principles to our current economic situation and has come up with the somewhat dire prognosis that the U.S. economy is going to hobble along during 2021 before reaching positive growth in the middle of 2022. So if that hasn't scared everyone away, I'm about to turn things over to Nick. Uh, but first, after his presentation, I will moderate a Q&A with him and field some of your questions. If you had registered for this event, you'll be able to submit a question through the link that you received in your confirmation email. And if you're just joining us without having registered, you can email your questions to the email address that's listed below on your screen. Thanks so much again for being with us here today, Nick. And thanks again to all of you for turning in, uh, tuning into this live stream. So Nick, take it away. Okay, thank you. I'll share my screen. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the first, you know, 20 minutes are going to be uh, the economic impact of COVID. Um, it's uh, or should I should say that's a it's a pretty uh, negative topic. So, so I'm going to try and end with the last 10 minutes on working from home, which is much more positive. And I, you know, you saw it flash up. I wanted to say warning. Uh, this contains very depressing economic forecasts, so I suggest you take precautions. Um, maybe a glass of wine, or possibly a uh, you know a glass of scotch. Um, I should say my wife is a Scot, and my uh, father-in-law uh, would not be very keen with spoiling good whiskey with ice. So I suspect that's bourbon on the right. So I'm going to go through uh, four key points and support them with a bunch of facts and figures. So I want to start off by saying, firstly, there is massive uncertainty uh, around everything to do with COVID. So medical po progress, the policy response, the industrial impact, the way consumers will respond. And in fact, you know, I recently asked a friend who is a senior forecaster, at a well-known institution you read about all the time in the news. And uh, he said, uh, since the beginning of March, we basically quit trying. If you ask me, it's a stupid exercise to forecast. And the only reason that anyone would attempt to forecast at any horizon is because they're getting paid, have no shame, are dr drunk or likely or three. So having said that, you know, we should be extremely cautious and I'll try and, uh, you know, suitably caveat everything I'm going to say. So I should start off by saying my PhD was actually on measuring uncertainty. So I started my PhD in 1996. And so I've been looking at this now for almost 25 years. And even by those you know, somewhat long run standards, these are incredible figures. So on the left 
is the S&P 500 implied volatility. It's called the VIX. It's basically a measure of stock market volatility. And it's, a, you know, it was just falling back from all time high levels or almost all time high levels, very similar to the peaks arrived in 2008, 2009 in the global financial crisis. And, you know, the average level of the VIX is about 15. So it's about fourfold its average level. On the right is something called the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. It's an index I've constructed with uh, Scott Baker, who is a former Stanford uh, Econ PhD student now at Northwestern and Steve Davis. And it's based on the uh, number or the share of newspaper articles that talk about economic policy uncertainty in leading US newspapers. And this has been normalized to have a long run average of 100 up until 2010. And again, it's at, like at astronomically high levels. So right now, over the last couple of months, it's around uh, 500 to five to 600. So it's like four or five times the long run average. Here's an, another data point, which is uh, from a survey called the Decision Maker Panel, which is a survey run by the Bank of England. It came about because after Brexit, uh, I, you know, I joined together with uh, a colleague at Nottingham and some people at the Bank of England to launch a survey to try and help the bank and the treasury in the UK steer their way through the, the Brexit impact. And it's now grown to become the largest monthly survey in the UK of firms. It covers about 3,000 firms per month. And from March onwards, we've been asking this question, which is, is COVID the largest source of uncertainty? And if you go to the you know, beginning of March, March the 6th, you see about 25% of firms reported COVID was their single largest source of uncertainty. So about in the, in the same period, there are around 25% of firms reporting Brexit was their single largest source of uncertainty. So at the beginning of March, it was kind of, you know, an economic battle of King Kong versus Godzilla. UK firms are getting hit by Brexit and COVID, and, you know, they were kind of battling it out. The other 50%, if you're wondering, was firms reporting more idiosyncratic things like the CEO health or a new product or some other issue. But you can see here by late March, you know, into April, COVID is now the single largest source of uncertainty for 90% of British firms. So it's just an overwhelming you know, driver of economic uncertainty. Another measure is the number of firms that have pulled earnings guidance. So firms in their quarterly earnings statements and in conference calls provide guidance for earnings. And starting in mid-March, firms have begun to say, basically, we just have no idea uh, the economy is so uncertain, we honestly cannot provide earnings guidance. And that number has grown from a trickle up until now more than one third of S&P 500 companies. So, you know, very famous companies, Starbucks, uh, FedEx, GE, et cetera, have literally said that they find it impossible to provide guidance and they've uh, pulled them. And again, this is amazing. I have you know, personally never seen before this period firms pull out earnings guidance en masse. So again, this is unprecedented as a measure of uncertainty. So having said that, what can we say? Um, well, before I show you the data in the short run, probably the number to have in mind is 20%. So it looks like unemployment is going to reach 20%, if not go above it. In fact, Steve Manu currently it's 14%. Steve Mnuchin said he sees 20 to 25% is where it's peaking out. And GDP in the current quarter, so that's 2020 quarter two, that's the quarter that started in April and will end at the end of July. So almost exactly halfway through, it looks like GDP will be down about 20%. So how do you come to these numbers? So on GDP, we can look at this graph from uh, this data from Moody's. So Moody's have done a fantastic exercise, which is they've counted up industry by industry, state by state, the amount of economic activity that has been taken out by the lockdown. And you can see at the beginning of April, that reached about 25%. It's probably by now about 30%. And it's likely to remain at 30%, you know, probably to the end of May. Uh, who knows, June, July, et cetera, what the rebound is. But, you know, between April and end of June, which is quarter two, you know, the guess is going to be something like 20 to 30 percent of GDP is just going to be totally lost through the lockdown. And so that's where this number of 20 percent estimate for quarter two economic output loss comes from. So just to step back, this is just an enormous number. I'll come back later. But 
we have not seen drops of GDP this size. You have to go back to the Great Depression from 1929 to 1933 to get anywhere near a drop of this size. The second thing that's striking about the COVID recession is just the speed. So, well, the speed of the COVID re speed of the COVID recession. So, it went from February 2020, which was a 60-year low rate of unemployment. So, uh, unemployment in February 2020 was 3.5%. You know that you have to go back to the 60s to find the measure that low, up to April 2020, which is unemployment is now already 14% and an 80-year high. So, you've gone from you know, basically within two months, the best uh, labor market in a generation to now the worst labor market in a generation. You know, another measure is of the 22 million jobs that were created after the end of the recession in 2009, those 22 million jobs were lost in the first four weeks of the current COVID recession. So these are just incredible speeds of drops. And I'm showing you data here from a second survey I'm involved in. This is a survey with the Atlanta Fed. And Chicago University, and it's basically the US Fed version of the survey I'm involved in in the UK. And here we asked firms about that anticipated coronavirus impact on sales. And you see, you know, the beginning of March, the forecasts were minus 5.5%. Now, that already is a very large negative. Five, you know, 5% 5 hit to sales is already extremely large for uh, any form of natural disaster or recession. But you can see this is also growing. So by you know late April, firms are forecasting 23% average drop in sales, which you know matches very much the GDP figure I just showed you. You know a third factor about COVID is it's had a hugely varied impact on firms and industry. So this is data from yet a third survey that I'm involved in, which is Stripe, the uh, U.S.'s largest fintech, which is headquartered up in San Francisco, and in fact their uh, CEO Patrick Collison spoke at the CEPA summit. Uh, last year. And this asks a few thousand, uh, you know, smaller U.S. firms what their expected impact for COVID will be again on 2020 quarter two sales. And again, we find very similar numbers here. The mean is minus 29 percent. The reason I put this up is to show you just the incredible variety. So we have something like, uh, you know, 13 percent of firms that are reporting negative 100 percent sales impact. So you know, they've been shut down completely. And on the other hand, we have about 25%, you know, almost 30% of firms that are reporting a positive impact of COVID on sales. And in fact, there's about 3% of firms that are reporting sales impacts of, you know, 50% or more. So again, in recessions, this is, a, you know, pretty unusual. Generally in recessions, most sectors rise or fall together. COVID feels more like, in some senses, a war in the sense that it's reallocating, you know, to some extent, reallocating activity. So if you look back in the history after Pearl Harbor in 1941, there was a massive process in the U.S. called conversion. So when they tried to convert the U.S.'s industrial base from making peacetime goods to making wartime goods. So one example is Detroit went from, make, you know, almost completely stopped making cars and converted to making airplanes. And we see some of the similar characteristics of COVID in that certain industries have been almost completely shut down, whereas others, for example, home delivery, you know, pretty rapidly cleaning, some of the online services have seen incredible growth rates. There's also huge variation across firms by founder types. So I put this up uh, to contrast to the 2008-2009 recession. So that had been nicknamed by uh, economists a man session. So the reason was in 2008, 2009, manufacturing and construction got hit particularly hard. And so there's a much larger rise in male than female unemployment in 2008 and 2009. The COVID recession looks different in the sense that it appears to hit uh, retail and healthcare particularly hard. And, you know, the early signs, if anything, female unemployment will be rising faster than male unemployment. We see similar, you know, a similar twist in the data we're looking at firms and our Stripe data by founder types. On the left, we just report by the degree of the founder, uh, the anticipated impact on their firms. And you can see firms that are founded by people with humanities degrees are, you know, much more pessimistic at minus 36% than, by, than those founded by people in STEM or social science, which would include economics. And on the right, there's a, you know, a similar difference between female and male. If you look in the data, this is almost entirely explained by industry mix. So, 
humanities, female founders tend to be more likely to be in healthcare uh, and retail, which are some of the worst hit sectors. So I, I, I didn't quite know how, how to bring this all together. Uh, so, you know, I, I think you could almost call COVID the Frankenstein recession. So it combines the size of the Great Depression. So that's on the top left with this, you know, so far unemployment's risen to 14%. It's likely probably to go to 20 to 25%. With to the top right, the speed of Katrina, which is, you know, a massive natural disaster. So Hurricane Katrina, I've shown you the initial claims data, the weekly unemployment claims data for Louisiana, the state of Louisiana. And you can see in 2005, the spike is very similar to the you know, beginnings of COVID, except of course, COVID is national. So whereas Louisiana you know, recovered reasonably quickly uh, because of an inflow, inflow of um, support, that obviously isn't gonna happen. So you know, if at all for the US. And down to the bottom, the third element is the reallocation of World War II. So I have a paper on that, which I've linked to below, but you know, I'm just gonna read you a quote from the Wall Street Journal, which says, the coronavirus pandemic is forcing the fastest reallocation of labor since World War II. With companies and governments mobilizing an army of idled workers into new activities that are urgently needed. You know, hence, I'm not that optimistic on the market. Now, there are reasons to be optimistic on the market. You know, people talk about the massive stimulus, uh, the fact that maybe the COVID drop is, you know, temporary, although I'm, you know, not a, that, that much of a believer. Uh, the fact that the market is very heavy in uh, high tech, which has done pretty well. You know, Personally, uh, I'm nervous the market is being priced off over-optimistic macro forecasts, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, you know, more fundamentally, the thing that I, you know, I think is difficult for economists and you know the finance in general is, is a profession is the just you know the breakdown between Wall Street and Main Street, which is in fact the front cover of this week's Economist. And here is a screenshot uh, taken by uh, Justin Horowitz, who is a you know high-profile Democrat tweeter that took a shot from Mad Money with Jim Cramer. And you can see the topic of the piece he was talking about was the Dow's best week since 1938. And down below the breaking news reports more than 16 million Americans have lost their jobs in three weeks. And you know it's really hard to see the uh, stock market doing so well alongside you know, the horrible news in the economy. So what about the long run? Well, there is an alphabet soup of uh, likely profiles. I have to say, I'm a believer in it's like to be a U or a W shaped uh, recovery. And to, to show you this, why don't I put up this uh, little graphic that's from the Wall Street Journal on Monday. So it talks about how economists compare the shapes of different recoveries to letters from the alphabet. So on the top left is maybe what you've heard people talking about. It's called the V-shaped recovery. So this is the rapid drop the rapid rebound, you know, Milton Friedman was probably most famous, the Nobel Prize winning Chicago economist for talking about this. So he said, if you take a guitar string, the harder you pull it down, the faster it snaps back. So hard down, hard back out. Maybe. Uh, I have to say, I'm not optimistic on a V-shaped recovery. Uh, I'm, you know, more of a believer in a U-shaped recovery, a W-shaped recovery, which is basically what the economics profession, I think the consensus is moving towards. So a U-shaped recovery is a drop and you know slow gradual rebound, or a W-shape could be if there's a second outbreak, say later in the fall. As you know, as Fauci was mentioning today, in fact, in his testimony to Congress, and it's worth remembering on the second outbreak, that is what happened with the Spanish flu pandemic in 2019. Potentially most uh, worryingly would be what's called an L-shaped recovery. So, you know, coronavirus does such damage and forces such major changes in the economy, it never really fully recovers. So this seems incredibly pessimistic, although, again, I have to fear that there's some element of an L-shaped recovery that's going to happen. I don't think we'll fully return to trend. You know, one piece of support for this is if you just look at what happened in 2008, 2009, his GDP per capita, that was basically an L-shaped recovery. We had a drop in 08 and 09. And we returned to trend, but we never made up for the lost growth. So finally, you know, why am I uh, pessimistic? What are these headwinds that I see on or around that are causing this U-shape or maybe L-shape? So there's a list of them. Um, J Jay Powell, when he was uh, addressing Congress a couple of weeks ago, mentioned the first three. So the first one is bankruptcies. 
you know, once a firm goes bankrupt and, you know, truly stops trading, it's extremely hard to restart it. And that's a permanent loss to the economy. The skills erosion. So when people become unemployed, particularly now after they've been unemployed for two, maybe three, even four or five months, they tend to lose their skills and it's very hard to get them reemployed. We saw it took 10 years, over 10 years to reemploy 22 million people after the last recession. The trade, uh, you know, if trade has been, you know, shut down or heavily restricted by COVID and, so, and by some of the current administration's trade moves, again, that's damaging for growth. If you think back to what happened from history around 1929 to 33, the Great Depression, there was the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, an anti-trade movement back then that was seen as a big impediment to recovery, and I think the same would be true now. Immigration, uh, you know, Silicon Valley in America thrives in immigration. I, you know, you can hear, I guess you can hear from my accent, I am an immigrant. I'm now a naturalized American citizen, but you know, I only moved here 15 years ago. Immigrants have apparently found half of Silicon Valley startups so are hugely important for growth. And then two other things I'll talk about in the slides. One is taxes. So on the left is a table from Torsten Slot from Deutsche Bank uh, showing the first two columns as taxes in terms of flow and the second two are ta taxes as debt uh, in terms of the stock to GDP. And looking at the first columns, uh, if you look at 2020, the debt to GDP numbers here are just extraordinary. So the US in 2020 is forecast to have something like 14% debt to GDP, which is an enormous amount of borrowing. So multiple trillions of dollars of borrowing. Of course, that's going to flow into ever higher debt levels. And on the right, we can see a chart of debt levels going back to, in fact, 1790. You can see that the peak of debt levels was right at the end of World War II, and it went to just over 110%. Current forecasts are we could be breaching that at the end of next year and go well beyond into 120, 130%. So debt to GDP is about to you know, hit all time you know, levels, unprecedented levels. Why am I worried about that? Well, I'm worried about that because debt, at least last time around at this level, so after World War II, led to sharp rises in income taxes that really took two decades to come down. So during and after World War II, top federal income tax rates went up to 90%, which is, you know, for those of us here, that is an eye-wateringly high amount of tax and would just be a killer on our growth. I mean, if you, if you think of in the last two or three years, we've ha had the kind of sugar high from the Trump tax cuts that have boosted growth up maybe half a percent. But that is nothing compared, you know, the reversing that, this would be like a negative 10 times that kind of tax cuts if we put federal tax rates up to 90%. So that would be, an, you know, if we have to put taxes up that high, that is clearly going to chill growth. The other driver is what I'm concerned about politically. So again, a couple of slides from Deutsche Bank. On the left is the share of American adults that have no emergency savings account. And if you look across age groups, on average, that's 53%. On the right is the response to the question about what they do if they couldn't have any more income, how long they could cu currently cover expenses. And you can see that those without emergency savings, the right bar, uh, only 40% can last one to three weeks. I, you know. Uh, sorry, only 40% can last one to two months. And by the time we get to three to five months, you know, less than a quarter of Americans with no savings can last that far. So given we're about two months, you know, we're coming on to almost two months into the shutdown, you know, there are a huge number of Americans facing serious hardship. So, you know, potentially reaching up to 100 million Americans. And that's not only a, you know, a genuine humanitarian crisis, but I think risks serious, you know, political issues. If, again, if you think back to history, if you look at what happened after the Great Depression, we had the rise of, you know, truly awful regimes with Hitler and Mussolini and Franco, etc. And again, I think, you know, whatever your your views on the current politics, you know, remember I'm a Brit, dual national, Britain American, so you know we've had, you know, pretty radical politics on both sides of the Atlantic. I don't think that's anything compared to what we could see if uh, we get, you know, extreme downturns. So. Uh, I'm guessing you finished your drink by this point. Uh, you know, I, it, it's very doubt. I now want to turn to something more positive, which is the promise of COVID, uh, of working from home post COVID. And the post is extremely important. So working from home during COVID is pretty awful. Post COVID, I think, could potentially be somewhat of a promised land. 
So as backdrop, um, working from home traditionally had a very bad image. So this is a 2017 search. I, uh, I took a photo from, from Bing, in fact. I took this because I gave a TEDx talk on working from home from Stanford, in fact, in 2017. And, you know, I took Bing because it provides uh, a whole series of other similar related search extensions. So, you know, this is just a terrible uh, image. If you look, there are, there are 15 photos down below and probably two or three of them are like positive images. Uh, the rest are basically naked people, cartoons, people with babies, basically just, I mean, this is just collectively a terrible view on working from home. And then if you look at the search terms, so working from home, the most common extensions are working from home funny, working from home comics, and working from home underwear. So, you know, this is a uh, truly awful uh, reputation on working from home uh, pre-COVID. So, you know, having worked from home myself in, you know, I used to work in the treasury and also in McKinsey before becoming an academic. I wanted to run a randomized control trial and got the opportunity to do so on C-Trip, which is China's largest travel agency. Uh, it's worth about $15 billion and NASDAQ has 40,000 employees. And here's a picture of its headquarters and Shanghai. And this looks very much like most other large American, you know, companies. Here's a picture inside. Again, looks like a typical office. It's slightly Dilbert-esque with cubicles, but you know this this is an advanced uh, economy com company and very similar to much of what most of us know. So they ran a randomized control trial. So the idea is they took a thousand employees from two divisions and asked them who wanted to work from home. 500 of them volunteered, 500 of them didn't. 500 them volunteered to work from home for four out of five days a week, and they then. James Liang, who's the chairman, and I should say a Stanford PhD alumni and currently on the CEPA advisory committee, uh, who is the founding CEO of C-Trip and is currently the chairman. James uh, pulled a uh, ping pong ball from an urn and it said even. And so people with even birthdays got sent home. So if you are on the second, fourth, sixth, eighth, tenth, et cetera, of the month, you were the winner. You got, you got your wish granted to work from home. And if you were odd, you were unfortunately had to remain in the office. And you, were in a, in the, you were the control group. So this is what individuals that are randomized home with even birthdays look like, probably pretty similar to what many of us recognize now, although, you know, they had two weeks to prepare. So Citric gave them proper equipment, made sure the broadband was working, made sure they had their own exclusive rooms that was not their bedroom, et cetera. So what, uh, so what did they find? So firstly, they found a massive improvement in performance. So they found on average working from home employees saw their productivity go up by 13%, which is huge. So that's almost a day extra a week. Um, we can measure it very accurately because these people are, you know, making telephone calls, taking bookings. So we have both quality and quantity measures. You know, C-Trip was, uh, you know, incredibly surprised by this. Their expectation in advance was actually people probably goof off. So their, their prediction was they'd save money on office space by moving people out, but they'd lose a bunch of this by, you know, people watching whatever, the Chinese version of, uh, you know, Love Island or Jerry Springer or setting up their own home businesses or falling asleep or whatever. But as it happened, working from home employees were significantly more productive. If you drill into the data, it turns out about 4% of this is they're more productive per minute. And when you interviewed them, they said it's quieter and easier to concentrate at home. And the other 9% is that they actually work their full shift. So when you look at the data, people in the office don't actually typically start at nine. They're often in at nine, 10, nine, 20, because they're late or the bus broke down or something and they take long lunch breaks and they leave early to let the cable repair guy in. That just happens substantially less at home. So that was a very positive outcome, finding one. Finding two, again, was very positive. Quit rates halved. So in C-Trip, the average attrition rate or quit rate per firm is about 50%. So the typical employee in this role lasted on average two years. And in fact, that turns out to be very similar to the average for the entire US economy. So believe it or not, there is incredible churn more amongst younger low-skilled workers, but 50% is about the average. For the working from home uh, treatment sample, that quit rate halved. So that is a huge saving of time and effort, obviously, for the firm and for the employees reducing turnover. And finally, choice was extremely important. So after the end of the nine months, the, the experiment was so successful, C-Trip rolled it out to the entire company and also let everyone re-optimize. 
and you know, again, to our surprise, about half of the people that had initially volunteered to work from home decided to come back into the office, and about half of them, no, sorry, about 20% of them initially opted not to work from home, changed their mind and decided actually they wanted to work from home. And so there was an enormous churn. You know, what this reflects from the interviews and talking to them is it's actually very hard to know how effectively you'll be able to survive working from home. And I guess we're all finding out right now, but in this experiment, you know, a lot of people either felt extremely uh, lonely and isolated or told us they fell, to, you know, fell victim to one of the three great enemies of working from home, which are the fridge, the bed and the television. And what we can see here is after the end of the experiment, in fact, the impact of working from home almost doubled to around 20, 25 percent, which tells you that working from home is a fantastic technology if you combine it with choice. You let people experiment and discover if it works for them. So C-Trip increased profits by around $2,000 per employee working from home and, in fact, very actively uh, rolled it out to the whole company. Now, interestingly, in survey data I have from the Bank of England, this you know 3,000 monthly firm surveys, we know what percentage of their employees are working from home, and we also got them to forecast their predicted impact on COVID on sales in quarter two. And you can see a very negative relationship, which, well, sorry, very positive relationship. So employees under the current lockdown or firms which have a high share of employees working from home are actually much more positive on COVID. So working from home, at least in the cross section, seems to be one way firms are helping at least to reduce the negative impact of COVID. But having said that, you know, while working from home for firms and for us is better than nothing, you know, it's still far from ideal. And it's hard for four reasons. Uh, I'm guessing I'm guessing many of you are going to get, you know, predict what these are, but why don't I go through them? So reason one, kids. Uh, I have four I have four kids, so you know, this is just extremely hard. Uh, the hardest is Catherine. So this is Catherine, my four-year-old, who, you know, maybe I'm a dad, but to me she seems very sweet. Uh, she just comes in all the time uh, asking to play. She nick her nickname for me is Dudu. So endlessly, you know, every you know every hour or so, come, Catherine comes in and says, "Dudu, can we play? I want to play. Are you ready?" Uh, I tell her I'm on a phone call. I have to work. And then why do you have to work? I have to earn money. And then she says, "Ah, oh, I have money." And she has this sweaty handful of old coins and stuff. I don't know where she got it from. So. That is you know, really hard to deal with. I'm sure many people empathize with similar versions of this. Secondly, job match. So it turns out only around a third of jobs can effectively be done from home. So that's the conclusion of a study by Jonathan Dingle and Brent Neiman from Chicago that did a detailed analysis combining the American Community Survey and ONET, which is a you know, kind of a very uh, detailed description of activities of jobs to figure out around one third of US jobs can effectively be carried out at home. And I've shown you a second data point, which is uh, the survey data again from the Bank of England, but you know, noting the UK and US are, you know, in this sense, structurally pretty similar, showing that around one third of UK employees are currently working from home. And you can see this varies dramatically by industry. So in fact, the industries that the Bay Area is kind of heavy in, so, you know, information, finance, you know, professional and scientific are actually very high. So the Bay Area is, uh, you know, fed one of the best parts of the country in terms of being able to work from home. But it's still the case. Only around a third of us can work from home. Of course, that's extremely, you know, intense in high skilled as in graduate and PhD jobs and very few non-graduate jobs can work from home. So I suspect most people on this video call can work from home. But, you know, if you go out to the general population, it is the minority. So thirdly, space, uh, you know, a number of us are really struggling with uh, very unsuitable uh, working conditions for working from home. So here are two photos of, uh, on the left, uh, you know, a graduate student of mine, Scarlett, and on the right, an uh, undergrad student of mine, Nikhil. Um, both of them, I, you know, been reaching out to many of my students over the last few weeks. I've heard many stories of uh, challenging working from home conditions. Scarlett on the left uh, is in an apartment with her fiance and, the problem is they both have a lot of conference calls and the soundproofing isn't great. So she said basically in the morning, if they have calls at the same time, she has to sit in the closet, close the door to reduce the soundproofing. And in the afternoon, her fiance, you know, switches and they have a rotor. But it's not the best uh, environment. Nikhil on the right, I was having a, uh, 
Skype, sorry, it was Zoom school that ha as it happened with him, and I could see a bunch of clothing in the background. I was asking him where he was, and it turns out he is in the walk-in closet of his uh, girlfriend. So, you know, it works for them, but I I've heard many stories of, you know, quite difficult working conditions. And then finally um, is full-time. So pre-COVID, only 2% of people work from, from home full-time. So this is survey data from the BLS. It happened to run a massive survey on working from home in 2018. And 85% of people said they never worked a full paid day at home. 15% did. Of the 15% that would work entire days at home, 8%, so basically half of them did it very occasionally, so typically once a month. And of the rest, you know, there's a scattering, but you notice there's only 2% of people before COVID that were working from home full-time. And having interviewed a lot of people over the years and working from home, most of this, I, I think, is people who have been, you know, for unusual circumstances. So, you know, the wife moves city to, because of her, she gets a new job. Her husband, you know, decides he'll keep staying with the same firm, but they don't have an office in the new city. So he works from home. So very few firms like, do I come across where they're onboarding people for five days a week working from home. And the reasons are, that, you know, there are three things the office tends to be important for. One is creativity. It's hard, not impossible, but it's hard to uh, be creative, harder at least to be creative at distance. It tends to work better interpersonally for coming up with new ideas, for brainstorming, for, you know, for, for, for innovating. Secondly, motivation. It turns out, you know, I don't know how everyone else feels, but, you know, the evidence is that it's much easier to get motivated, to get inspired, you know, to maybe get that sense of competition for being in the office. And then finally is loyalty. Uh, you know, we tend to feel loyal to our firms and our employers if we're in the office and seeing our coworkers. And in reverse, if we're at, you know, at home five days a week indefinitely, it feels more like a gig job. You know, there's just maybe you're working for Uber as a driver in some sense. You're not really actually, you don't feel like there's such a strong affinity to a workplace in the sense you know the employees and their backgrounds and you know you socialize with them. So my three tips of working from home post COVID is one is to do it part time. I think post COVID by which I mean, you know, who knows when the pandemic will end, but one or two years from now, when hopefully the current pandemic is gone, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be, you know, longer lingering fears uh, of future pandemics. But I think part time for those that can, so the third of the population that can, probably two days per week at home, maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays. That prevents, you know, the work from home day converting into long weekends, which bosses often worry about. And scheduling it regularly, is it seems to be the most effective way to do it. So you say, I'm going to be in the work office as with the whole team on Monday, on Wednesday, on Friday. So I know on those three days I'll be in. So all my meetings, my lunches, my coffees, I schedule on those days. And the other quiet time, the, you know, writing reports, doing emails, recording things maybe I do on the Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I reschedule my week a bit to make sure I can exploit quiet time on Tuesdays and Thursdays and group time on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Secondly, it should be optional. So from C-Trip, and in fact also from a recent Gartner survey of US employees, only around 50% of people actually want to work from home. So if you, you know, when we were in China, it, it turned out that younger uh, single people without kids actually wanted to come into the office most of them. It was, you know, people like me, older, married with kids that are actually are happier to work from home. So I think it has to be a choice. And finally, it should be a privilege. So underperformers, you know, people that goof off at home should be warned. And if they repeatedly uh, don't perform, they need to be recalled into the office. So for all of these three reasons, you can see I'm not recommending getting rid of offices at all. I'm just recommending increasing the intensity of working from home post-COVID. So, you know, on numbers and my prediction, pre-COVID, you can quite accurately estimate from the BLS data, 5% of working days were from home. So roughly the average American was spending about one working day per month at home. During COVID, the numbers look more like 35%, so a seven-fold increase. Post-COVID, I predict is going to be something more like 15 to 20% working days at home. So by no means is the office going to disappear you know, office uh, share of our time will shrink from 95 to probably 80%. So it's a reduction, but it's not a you know, cataclysmic drop. The most speculative thought is, you know, the bigger impact in office is maybe more a rejig of what actually we, we do. So going from something like on the left photo, which is San Francisco, uh, to something more like on the right, which is, I don't know if you watch The Office, I do, I'm a big uh, Michael Scott fan. 
uh, it's the actual building, but you know, more like these kind of office industrial parks. The reason is the kind of high rise downtown office buildings on the left have some pretty serious challenges with social distancing now and to the extent that lingers post COVID, in particular mass transport and elevators. Uh, and on the right, you know, it's just more spacious and easier to spread out. So with that, I'm going to end and say, if you're interesting, uh, there's some further reading and, you know, feel, please feel free to go to my uh, website and look at this or uh, anything else. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Nick, so much for uh, those remarks. I'm just going to ask you uh, one question from each part of your presentation before turning to uh, questions from our audience. So the first question that I have is, um, you know, here in the US, the federal government's response to COVID-19 has been unprecedented with all, almost $3 trillion spent already uh, by the US federal government and with more likely coming down the pike. And you know, I'm just curious, have your sense of how do we balance the concerns about a rising federal debt level, which you showed that nice figure where we're going up, likely going beyond World War II levels, uh, with the immediate needs of tens of millions of displaced workers, state and local governments, uh, and so forth. Yeah, I, you know, we we were talking earlier about state and local, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do the classic politician thing of throwing the question back to you. But on the federal government, uh, you know, so I've been discussing with other economists. Is you know, there's an interesting move amongst economists, and I think the market more generally to what being more Keynesian. So, you know, 2008, 2009, we had a very aggressive uh, stimulus package. It seemed at the time pretty unprecedented. Now, you know, the speed and size of it is multiple times faster. In fact, the market was responded very positively. So it sees that as helpful. So in that sense, you know, I think the federal stimulus package has been extremely uh, helpful. On the other sense, you know, we've now accumulated uh, this enormous debt level. And there's really only three options going forward. One is higher taxes. I think we will see some of that, potentially some of the unraveling of the Trump tax cuts, including on companies, actually. Uh, secondly, higher inflation. That doesn't seem likely. Uh, in fact, you, I don't know if you saw, but inflation numbers today are actually negative. The consumer price index dropped. And thirdly, maybe we just live with a higher level of debt, which is kind of the Italy mode. So Italy and Southern Europe picked up a lot of debt. That's fine. As long and as America, we can do that. The only risk is, you know, if we get hit by another pandemic in 2029 or some big war or something else, and we're carrying 140% of debt to GDP, we don't have anything left. So I don't feel totally comfortable about that. Um, so that's the federal level. But you know, I should ask you about state and local. I'm, I'm not an expert at all on that. Yeah, state and local, I mean, I think the challenge is that they don't really have the luxury of running a large deficit. They're sort of required to run essentially balanced budget. Uh, they can get around it a bit with accounting maneuvers and so forth, but it's pretty difficult. And right now you see lots of governors and mayors clamoring for more support from the federal government in a hope that what they are hoping for is a big, another big stimulus package that would have uh, significant amounts of funds for them. Um, but I think it's, it's gonna, we're gonna hear more about that in the coming days, I'm sure. Um, and then turning to the second part of your presentation um, regarding work from home, so it, can be good here and there, but doing it every day, week after week after week. We're now into the ninth week of the lockdown here in, in uh, Santa Clara County and at Stanford. Um, what can firms be doing to keep the productivity and morale of their workers up uh, during this bizarrely long stretch? And we don't really know how long it's going to go. Um, it's a great question. I mean, I, I've been spending probably about a third of my day talking to people about working from home for the, from the last you know, month and a half. I'd say there are three kind of quick tips. Maybe they seem obvious, but I'll just go through them anyway. One is uh, try and convert as many phone calls into video calls. So, you know, I used to have a lot of daily phone calls. Now I miss that interpersonal, you know, touch with, with other people. And at least there's a halfway house is doing video calls. So I think conference calls and phone calls should be replaced by video calls if possible. Secondly is scheduling. So uh, for a lot of people, they're really struggling with space and with looking after kids. And I've heard... Many people, couples or those sharing space to say, what they do is, you know, the, the husband will take, let's say, the living room and work in the morning and the wife will look after the kids in the afternoon, they switch. And the reason that's important to schedule and to keep a schedule, it's much easier for both parties then to say to colleagues, hey, look, I can take work calls all morning, I just can't do it in the, in the afternoon. And, you know, the types of work that graduates do is so concentration intensive, it's much better, to be honest, to have full-time concentrating for half the day than juggling kids. And then the third thing is, 
I hear a lot of managers, and in fact, I've, yeah, I've done it myself, my own research groups, is um, try and set aside now a little bit of meeting time just to deliberately talk about social issues. So it's odd when you're in the office, when you, before you end, start a meeting or when you leave, you have that chit chat, you know, how's your son doing? What's the weekend? Did you watch the game? That's just absent on, on you know, video calls. And so uh, to the extent possible, deliberately set aside kind of 10 minutes, maybe at the beginning to go around. One of the reasons is working from home is probably generating a huge rise in uh, mental health issues because it's very isolating. And so I think it's important for all of us to try and reach out to colleagues and friends just to try and touch in and reduce the sense of isolation this is bringing up. Okay, uh, great. All right, so I'm going to turn to some questions now from our audience. And please, uh, uh, those watching, feel free to send them in. I'm sure I won't be able to get through all of them. But uh, first one is the New York Times had an article recently in which it detailed employer surveillance of computer usage by employees who work from home. Um, and this uh, also provides a measure of productivity. Do you think these sorts of controls are likely to increase as people work from home more? And what is your view on them? So increase, certainly. In fact, I uh, had an interview with someone from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. She's at the end of last week. And she said, she was doing a piece on working from home. And she said, oh, I just come off the phone call from a company. I've forgotten their name. It's like Tech Hub or something that makes surveillance equipment. And she said, they are just, demand is going through the roof. So uh, this was more, you know, more invasive, it felt more creepy. It was like number of mouse movements. And if you had a camera, you allow it to look where your eyes are. I mean, really quite extreme stuff. Um, you know, interesting enough, I was having discussion at the end of last week. I think it sounds very odd, but I think some of this stuff could actually be extremely helpful. Why? There's a lot of stigma and associated working from home. And for those of us, which is the large majority that are actually productive at home, we may actually want, you know, our work and bosses to realize that we're productive and our colleagues to think, you know, we're not goofing off. So my sense on this surveillance stuff is a kind of a bit of a mixed bag. So some people really loathe that. I, I totally aware it's an infringement on liberties. But for other people, if you've managed teams, high performers actually really want to be appreciated and recognized for this. So it's possible. You know, the anecdote is kind of like my kids with the cell phone. We put on, um, we suggested putting, where's my phone on? And they're extremely reluctant to have the where's my phone software installed. And we said, well, look, we can be more relaxed. We can let you go out later. And of course, suddenly at that point, they were quite keen. And it's worked well. We can let them go out later and travel because we know where they are. And in fact, we've never looked at it because they haven't, you know, unless they come back late, we don't use it. So I, you know, this surveillance stuff is clearly going to increase. I'm kind of mixed on whether it's good or bad. I think there should really be choice to the employee as to whether it's used, actually. That's probably the critical thing. Okay, great. Uh, another question is, to what extent might unemployment insurance and other social safety nets that weren't in place during the Depression era help blunt the economic downside that you're suggesting? Yes, so um, that's definitely important. And uh, so to be clear, most of the stimulus, a lot of the stimulus, in fact, the unemployment insurance, there's two concepts. It's not, I should be clear, it's not really stimulus in the sense it's not trying to actually get people to go back to work. This is what's been called a recession by design. We've tried to persuade people not to work. We've told them not to work. What it's instead is insurance. So that's exactly a, you know, the right way to ask it. Um, unemployment insurance, as long as we are telling people they can't work, we have to provide unemployment insurance. And in effect, we're paying people to stay home and not to get infected and to infect each other. In fact, one of the problems fiscally right now that's becoming aware, and there's kind of a topic that's coming up last week and this week, is initially when all the stimulus or insurance, I should call it, was put in place, the assumption was it'd be a V-shaped recession. So most of this stuff is expiring at the end of June or July. And instead of it's a long drawn out recession, we're going to end up having to borrow a lot more money. And then the questions get much tougher. So... I think it's important to do it. Uh, it's, you know, it gets harder as the year, you know, drags on into next year. We're going to have extremely high levels of unemployment. I assume we're continuing to provide it, but at much less generous levels. Great. Okay. So on the V-shaped recovery, we have a question. Uh, what is the biggest risk factor that you think is stopping us from a V-shaped recovery? What are the indices that you will continue to follow to monitor the uncertainty and change in sentiments, if any? Oh, indices. Uh yeah. Yeah. I'm an uncertainty guy. So <laughs> I'm likely to, you know, suggest, you know, oddly enough, not Wall Street. I don't want to count. I don't want to stock market's wrong. Uh, there are many reasons. And I, we could have a long discussion about why it's high or low. I, you know, it doesn't tend to, it's not wholly representative of U.S. firms and it's overweight in tech and it's long run. I, you know, things more like 
uh, some of the Michigan Consumer Surve Sentiment Surveys. I've been running surveys with Atlanta Fed asking firms about their forecast in the Bank of England. They're actually very useful. We ask firms how they forecast things forwards. You know, I have my Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, which is uh, basically coverage of uncertainty in newspapers. I mean, I think I went through the list. The big barriers is unfortunately a long list of them. It's no like Jay Powell mentioned three was firm bankruptcies, you know, persistent unemployment and the collapse of trade. And you can add to that, you know, the, you know, the uh, stopping migration uh, debt, um, uh, you know, polit potential politics. I just unfortunately don't see a rapid rebound. If we look at previous recessions, it's really hard to see rapid rebounds of the size we want. I'm not sure if we've ever seen one before. I mean, 2008, 2009, there was no rebound at all. Uh, so I hate to say it, but I see us in a deep hole and it's going to be a very gradual recovery. Great. Okay. Another question uh, regarding uh, unemployment. What is the projected unemployment from the failure of small businesses? Uh, most of these firms do not have the liquidity to survive two months uh, being shut down. Yes, I don't. I mean, we've been serving. I don't have the figures to hand. Um, there are numbers. I'm trying to recall them off the top of my head. There's some survey. In fact, there's a survey the MBR put out asking firms how long they could survive uh, shut down and something like 50 percent of small businesses, you know, can't survive more than six months. The aggregate and it's so small. I've in the surveys that I've looked at, you know, to respond to the question, you're right. The small businesses are getting significantly worse hit than large businesses. I didn't show you the, the uh, data plot, but if you were to plot expected impact of COVID, against firm size, you see small businesses are much more negative than large businesses. And that's, I've seen that in both our Stripe survey and the UK and US survey. So that's a pretty routine finding. And I think it reflects the fact that right now, unfortunately, what's happening, there are two types of businesses. There are those that are going under that they're pretty marginal before the recession and then got hit and got pushed under. And in some senses, you know, that's creative destruction. It's not clear whether the government should step in. But the much greater group, I would have thought, are those that are actually uh, ongoing, you know, successful ongoing businesses, the kind of firms in a sense you'd want to, you know, chapter 11 tries to protect, but we want to kind of mass chapter 11, large numbers of firms to tide them over for six months. But when the economy recovers, they can start up again, because actually having them go bankrupt is very costly. In terms of unemployment, the figures are 20, 25%. It will peak at and slowly come down at, which is just an enormous number. Honestly, it's, uh, we're already at rates. So, the current current population survey and the data used to create unemployment and employment data goes back to 1948. And we have not seen a level of unemployment that high or collapse the number of jobs that fast since these data have begun. So the data going back to the Great Depression I showed you is spliced from all kinds of other sources. It's like before records begun. Uh, so, you know, 20, 25 percent, whatever it is, it's just, you know, we haven't seen anything since, you know, like that since like 30, 1931, 1932. Um, terrific. Okay. Uh, you've uh, another question about some work that you've, uh, or the, some writings that you've recently had. You've written about how the COVID induced shift to work from home could cause housing prices in previously expensive cities to fall. Uh, how dramatic of an effect do you see this to be? What other thoughts do you have on the spatial distribution of housing prices across the country? It seems cities also have valuable amenities that people may uh, value even after being on lockdown for a long time. Yes, yeah, so you know, have it, uh, you know, I should caveat this with I was negative on house prices after 2008, 2009 and got it wrong. Uh, I mean, they, they fell a bit, but they didn't fall anywhere near the amount I thought they would. So one point to note is house prices, unlike almost any other asset, take a while to change. So it seems odd, but the stock market is what's called a random walk. It's, it's impossible basically to predict changes in stock markets. But house prices, when they fall, they fall, they tend to fall for a while. So they are one thing that's really helpful to look ahead and see which way the wind is blowing. I think house prices are going to be severely hit, particularly apartments in large uh, metropolitan areas like San Francisco, New York. Why? Um, I mean, in the sh you know, there's two or three reasons. One is if you really increase the amount of working from home. The types of people that are kind of skilled and are able to work from home live in those apartments. And so if you're only commuting two, three times a week, it's more appealing to move out. I also think that the general fear of density and you know social contact is going to make it less appealing to be in the center of big cities. Because remember, you're more reliant on um, mass transit, more reliant on elevators. The level of the fall is harder to say, but I was looking the other day at Case Schiller. It's worth remembering that the prices of... Um, 
property in like New York and San Francisco has gone up by, I think it was 100, is increased by about 150, maybe 200 percent since 2000. So it's something close to three times the level we were in the late 90s. So, you know, drops of 50 percent, you know, seem possible. I, I don't really have a way of forecasting. I just if it were me, I definitely would not be buying uh, apartment blocks at the top of tall buildings and, you know, large city areas. And if you have the option to sell, I personally would probably sell now. The market's going to drop, I suspect, but it will continue to drop for a while and it's a lot easier to get out early. It'd be like selling your shares on the 28th of February. I wish I had. I didn't. You know, after the first drop, I thought, oh, that's it. And of course, I was completely wrong. Uh, but, you know, we, with housing, it, it moves more slowly so you can kind of slightly get ahead of the curve. Okay, uh, great. Uh, how resilient do you think the economy will be to a second wave of COVID in the fall of this year? Um, it's hard to tell. You know, one, one. I was having a discussion with an extremely senior policymaker last week. I won't mention who they were because it's kind of off the record. We'd all recognize their name, but uh, they were saying, you know, their advice. Uh, the, the increasing the view, and by the way, they're not American. So increasing the view is that um, if you look at quality adjusted life years, um, so the number of quality adjusted life years we're losing from the lockdown, it's potentially as many now as we're saving. So just to be clear, we know there's plenty of evidence that mortality rates spike after people retire, spike dramatically after businesses are bankrupt. Basically, unemployment generates a big increase in mortality rates and long run deterioration of health. So I think there's a very real awareness, just if we just wanted to you know, increase the life outcomes for Americans, it's not clear how much we'd want to extend the lockdown. So I wouldn't be surprised that there's a resurgence in the fall, but in the fall, I'm guessing we will not enter heavy lockdown again the way we have now, because I think by that point, the debate and the view will be the economic cost is too high. So I suspect we'll have milder testing, contact tracing, rolling lockdowns, but nothing like we see now, because I, this is a personal opinion, but I think it will be perceived as just too economically expensive to go back through that all over again. Okay, two more questions. Uh, one, do you have a view on whether the policy response in Europe and or Japan has been better than here in the U.S.? Um, I, you know, I'm not going to answer that question because I'm not I don't know the details of each country well enough. I do know that within the US, it, what's been striking, and many commentators have made this point, that the Federal Reserve has been, frankly, fantastic. Um, and the administration, so you know, basically Congress, trusts the Federal Reserve in the way. So if you look at 2008, 2009, the Treasury ran a lot of policy. Uh, in the current pandemic, a large amount of policy decisions have been passed over by the Federal Reserve, and it, Congress trusts them to carry it out and to have the capability to do it. The Fed also has the ability to be extremely fast. The problem is the Fed is limited. So the Fed has been really great. So you know, I have to say, I am so grateful that Trump did not fire Jay Powell. Oh, if he'd fired Jay Powell, I mean, he is like the Superman for the economy right now in terms of if the Fed wasn't acting. I mean, I am aware that there's a massive organization behind the Fed, but in general, the Fed is really keeping us going. Um, the problem is they're not perfectly equipped to deal with this. For example, they're only allowed to give loans. They're not allowed to give grants, which is pro which is really what we need. They're, they're constrained on a lot of what their activity. So the U.S. Uh, response has been pretty good. Uh, you know, Stanford has right now a passing or a failing grade. That's it. It's a it's pandemic special. Um, and on that basis, I would give Congress and the Fed a passing grade. I give the Fed are passing grade A plus if I'm allowed to, you know, breach the rules. But they've been pretty good. They've been fast, you know, and rapid. I wouldn't say on the health side. That's the economic side. I don't want to comment on uh, the health side of it. I want to stay apolitical there. Okay. One uh, one final question. I'm sorry I didn't get to get to everyone's questions, but uh, there are a number, quite a few students who have tuned in, and uh, they are curious for your advice. Uh, you know, uh, as they consider professional paths, given your expectations for the future? Uh, you know, it's a great question. It's, you know, one thing that's clear is to continue from this pandemic is continue education. So another thing that normally in recessions, graduates and particularly, you know, postgraduates do relatively better. Their unemployment rate doesn't spike up as much. In the COVID recession, unemployment rates of non-graduates have risen 
even more than they normally do. So the current recession is particularly unfortunate for the low educated because they're in the types of jobs that require face to face contact. So, you know, one, uh, you know, immediate piece of advice for this and for parents with kids is, you know, never before have I seen that education is really the best protector against economic hardship. It's not perfect. So there are many graduates losing their jobs and severe difficulties. But if you look at the, uh, you know, the uh, latest, the uh, labor report that came out last Friday, already you can see a much bigger gap opening up between graduates that are most, you know, like listeners, many of us, are, you know, it's not great, but we're definitely surviving versus non-graduates who have to be in face-to-face -face contact and have basically lost their jobs and their prospects are much bleaker. I mean, automation was already an issue and we've thrown on top of that, uh, you know, pandemic risk. Life is getting increasingly hard for the uh, less educated. And, you know, it's a general policy take that this should be a, yet another reason why we should be working hard policy-wise to, you know, work in America's schools and education. I mean, this is a long-run thing, but if there is ever a salutary reminder, it's this. Great, wonderful. So with that, I think we should wrap up. Uh, and Nick, thank you so much for joining us here at CEPR. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. We've got more events coming down the pike in the coming weeks. And I hope you'll uh, tune into those as well. And in the meantime, uh, stay healthy and safe. And uh, thanks again. See you soon. Thank you, Mike.